Hello my fellow content seekers, I'm the Culture Crusader and today I'll be reviewing The Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 5 titled The Pirate. Now I'll start with a brief non-spoiler section as usual. Uh, this episode definitely had some cool parts, it also had some really stupid parts, so overall I think I'd give it about a 5 out of 10. Um, at least it drove the plot forward somewhat and it had some pretty cool action scenes. Um, it kind of felt more low budget compared to other episodes I feel. Um, due to just the number of extras in scenes and some of the set pieces and things just didn't feel that uh, that professional. Um, but other than that, it was not a bad episode, it's just not overly good either. So that's why it's a 5 out of 10. Beyond that, there's not really much else to say, so we'll be moving into spoilers now. So Grief Karga's city comes under siege by the Pirate King, and he refuses to surrender, which... Well, it might be admirable, it's not entirely very smart, because he has actually no plan other than surrender. Like, usually if you refuse to surrender, it means you plan to fight, but he doesn't have anyone to fight with. He doesn't have a standing military, he doesn't even have a policing force, his one marshal has off gone off to do something else. He's got nothing, there's no way he could fight against these, these pirates. And yet he still refuses to surrender, which at that point, I don't even know if it's a good decision or not. I would have hoped that someone like him would have maybe like uh, scavenged the um, imperial facilities that remained on his world after the empire left, and you know collected all the equipment and vehicles and weapons and everything, and then outfitted some of his people with those weapons and vehicles and equipment so that they could have their own standing military or at least militia. But his his population seems very small as well, so I don't know. Maybe he just really ha doesn't even have the numbers to do that. Either way, um, I don't really think he's done a very good job. He's completely unprepared for something like this, and he just completely relies on the goodwill of the New Republic, despite not even being a part of the Republic, which just seems like a recipe for disaster. And obviously it is, because this happens. So the pirate starts opening fire on the civilians. And honestly, the pirate ship guns are pretty pathetically weak. Like, they just smash a couple of buildings and kill, like, maybe five people. And that's about it. It's not really what you'd expect from, like, the full firepower of a pretty large ship up directly above the city. Um, it almost looks no stronger than like an ATST or something like that, which is just a bit strange. Alright, so something that's almost entirely inconsequential, but I thought I'd mention anyway, is Grief Karga mentions something to do with the Spinwood Patrol, which doesn't really make sense because Spinwood is a circular direction. It's not like you can't go, it's not like north where you can go all the way north and you're at the end of north, that's as far north as you can go. Spinwood just, you keep going and just keep going around the galaxy. And so, Spinwood Patrol has no meaning, it's Spinwood of where? And so, that's just some little technical term they threw in there and didn't bother figuring out how it works. So, they're going to get called out on it even if it's completely irrelevant and doesn't matter at all. Alright, so he sends a transmission to this uh, ranger guy at the New Republic outpost and I mean it's cool to see X-Wings and Y-Wings and just you know rebel pilots and things like that. That's all nostalgic and great. But then once this guy gets the message, he for some reason decides the best course of action is to fly all the way from the outer rim to Coruscant, right in the galactic core. And if the showrunners had any sense of time, this would be a terrible tactic because by the time he's had, had a chance to do that and then come back and then actually do something to help, it'll all be over. You know, the pirates will have already completely annexed Grief Karga's world. That's, that's what's going to happen if this show follows any sense of logic. But we learn he has to go to Coruscant because his transmissions haven't been getting any responses for weeks or something like that because they're so busy. And so if he wants them to stop ignoring him, he's going to have to go there face to face. Now, if he really wanted to help and Command wasn't responding to his transmissions, surely he would just take his flight of X-Wings and go and respond to the call. They're like, there's no point in even having a remote outpost and patrol if they don't have the authority to actually respond to contact and do their job in keeping the peace. They shouldn't need to call Coruscant every time something comes up that needs their attention. That's not... Like, there's got to be someone at this outpost who has a high enough level of authority to authorize things like this. This whole part about having to go all the way to, to Coruscant and back is just put in there because whoever wrote this show doesn't understand how militaries work. Either that or it's uh, maybe some really clever... Uh, 
really clever plot to show us how incompetent the New Republic are because they haven't been depicted in a very positive light at all. And this guy seems pretty fed up with it. So they are intentionally depicting them as um, not necessarily the good guys, not necessarily always in the right. But I think this, this choice was definitely just a, a bad writing decision. It wasn't some intentional thing. And then Zeb from Rebels makes an appearance and I wasn't even sure if this was him or not. I only found out later from seeing stuff. I knew it was a Lassat. I just didn't know if it was him. And yeah, he looks cool. He looks cool in live action. Um, but whatever. I mean, I don't care about Rebels. I don't want to be reminded of that. That was not a good show for the most part. There was some cool stuff. But anyway, um, that's just some fan service there that a lot of fans of Rebels will probably get hyped on. Then for the next half of this episode, time ceases to exist as he teleports to Coruscant and then walks into the New Republic's Navy headquarters. And somehow, this traitor chick is still here. She literally fried a man's brain in a room that probably had security cameras, and even if it didn't, she was the only one there who could have possibly done it. How is she not in prison? She's so obviously still an Imperial. It's just insane that these incompetent idiots don't see it, and they keep letting her in on their tactical meetings and discussions. I never thought I'd see the day when the Rebel Alliance adopts the genius liberal policy of letting all the prisoners walk free and trying to integrate them back into society when they clearly have not changed their ways. But here we are. That's exactly what this is. Now, I do like the idea of redemption, and I like the idea that not all Imperials were evil. Some certainly could have become productive contributing members of the New Republic. But when you give someone a second chance, and her response is to entrap a fellow ex-Imperial, talk him into committing a crime that he would never and honestly could never have committed without her, then literally fry his brain and essentially openly murder him, I think you might be taking your amnesty program just a little bit too far. Even the things she says in this meeting are so clearly pro-imperial, but somehow when our rebel pilot calls her out on it, he's the one who gets in trouble. Like, oh, sorry, sir, I know she was part of the genocidal military arm of the tyrannical government we just fought to overthrow, but I'd hate to upset her feelings, my mistake. Like, at least they're setting it up so the viewers still know she's evil, and the New Republic are clearly the ones in the wrong here. So I guess, while it's still dumb, at least it's not preachy. For a minute there, I thought we had, like, the, you know, the mentality of it doesn't matter what someone does, the worst thing you can possibly do to them is hurt their feelings. But in this case, I think it is clear that our rebel guy is, is right, so at least it's not, it's not preaching to us. Anyway, so our pilot only makes the matters worse because now he's tied his own hands by asking permission and being explicitly forbidden from taking action. If he'd just taken action and sought forgiveness later, then things would have been much better off. But, you know, he has no choice now. The only thing left that he can think to do is to contact the Mandalorian and ask for his help. So Grief Karga addresses the people of Navarro, and it's like 12 people, like not literally, but that's only like a handful. That's like 30, what, something like that? I don't know. I'm like, is this, are we supposed to believe this is the majority of the population? Or are we supposed to believe that this is all that remains and the majority are dead? Either way seems kind of laughable. And it's almost as lacking as some of those scenes in the Wheel of Time where they couldn't use extras due to social distancing guidelines at the time of filming. It's just so underwhelming. Like, this is the whole population of the planet? Are you kidding me? What? And also, they're all just standing out in the open, like, kind of near a small outcropping, but they would totally be plainly visible from the pirate ship above, and they're within eyesight of the city, so they're really not far away. But he gives his speech, and it's just the most frail, hopeless thing ever. I mean, he's, he's, that's the point. He's acting that way because I think we're supposed to get the impression that Grief Karga, as, as a character, really isn't holding out much hope for the New Republic to come and save him. But man, again, bad leader. It doesn't matter whether you have hope. Project hope and project, like, strength and, and courage and optimism to your people. Otherwise, they're just going to be so down and then they're going to start turning on each other and turning on you. Like, you're not being a good leader here. Now we cut back to the rebel pilot, whose name I honestly haven't bothered to learn, and... He's now found the Mandalorian's hideout, and how did he find them? Well, turns out, back in the Rebellion, he served with the R4 unit that Mando bought in Episode 2. You know, the R4 unit that's been on Tatooine ever since the very start of the original Star Wars movie, when Luke's uncle nearly bought it? Yeah, that R4 unit was apparently in the Rebellion even before that, and has since been... 
I guess, undercover on Tatooine this entire time? Because otherwise, how did he know the R4 unit had even been purchased by Mando? Were they in communication this whole time? Why? If the R4 unit was such a good friend from the old rebellion, why did he leave him on Tatooine for like two decades or however long this is? That doesn't really make sense. And even if the R4 unit was undercover on Tatooine, what for? Like, maybe the Rebels have seen Disney's plans for Star Wars and they realize that literally everything is set on Tatooine for some reason, and maybe he's just there to keep them informed. That's honestly the only conclusion I can come to. Why would the R4 unit be repeatedly reporting into him all the time? Oh, hey, I got bought by some Mandalorian. Like, why? Because that's the only way it makes sense. Otherwise, he couldn't possibly have known Mando had the R4 unit unless the R4 unit told him. Anyway... Also, why would the, neither the Jawas, nor that stupid mechanic lady, nor Mando wipe the droid's memory at any point? Like, surely when, you know, if I buy an iPhone off someone, I don't want the bloody iPhone to have all their data on it. I just want it re factory reset, obviously. Same goes for any electric device, a computer, whatever. I don't want to buy it with all your, like, all your documents on it. It's the same with a droid. You don't, you're not buying it for all the memory bank it has in the past, except in some very specific circumstances, why would none of them have wiped it? This is the exact reason why you would wipe it, is so that it can't betray you to its former masters. Anyway, so he flies in and for some reason, the Mandos don't shoot him down the moment he arrives, but at least this time they do have someone on guard duty. So maybe they've learned from the Raptor attack, I guess, although why they didn't learn after the first Raptor attack, I have no idea because it's implied that that happened over and over and over, and they just never bothered to put someone on guard duty to shoot it down the next time it comes. But at least they're a bit more competent now, I suppose. He tells them that Grief Cargo is under attack, and he tells them that R4 is a traitorous spy, and they do nothing. It seems like they just keep the droid with them for some reason, which is going against everything they stand for. They've got to relocate their whole covert, but they're going to take the droid with them? The droid that's already a spy and has already given up their, their location once? I would have said, take the damn droid with you. If it's a bloody rebellion spy, then keep it with you. I don't want it. Like, obviously, shut it down. We just chuck it in the ocean, feed it to a turtle croc. I don't know. Why would you keep it? But no, it seems like they do. Mando gives a speech to try to convince them to fight for Grief Karga. And just like Grief Karga's speech, it's the most frail, weak, pathetic thing I've ever heard, second only to Obi-Wan's speech in his abomination of a show. You know that, everyone, everyone, the Empire will be here soon. We cannot fight them. That speech, you know, the one that was just the most abysmal thing ever. This is on a par with it, honestly. It's a little bit above. Thankfully, Paz gets up to speak. And Paz is kind of one of those funny characters where, like, at any moment he could go either way. Like, you know, sometimes he's so, so hard against Mando, and other times he actually supports him and agrees with him and helps him. And I actually like that. I mean, some might try to argue it's inconsistency of character, but I don't really think it is. I think it's, it's less realistic when you write a character who is always against what the main character is doing or always on their side like this is this is more realistic so i like it and this is the one speech that isn't weak and pathetic i actually quite like it he gets up starts to speak um you know he starts out kind of talking about the things that have happened to them and and all the stuff that mandalorians have been through for the, the latest you know few years few decades whatever and basically he demonstrates that he's the only one of them who actually possesses a spine in this speech. It's honestly, it's a shame he didn't have that spine back when the raptor took his son and he was immediately ready to just give up, but he does now. And this is where it sort of starts getting good. Um, he asks why they'd risk their lives for Mando's friends and for an uncertain hope of a better future. He sort of pauses and he comes out with this like, because we are Mandalorians thing. And he says it much more powerfully than that. But that part made me smile. Because we are Mandalorians. It's like, yes, of course. We're going to go fight for a better future. Obviously, we're Mandalorians. The fighting is what we do. It's good. It made me smile. And I wish the whole show depicted them as being as strong and capable as Paz's speech makes them seem. And they say they only have two ships, but that begs the question of how the hell did all these Mandos get there in the first place? It's not like they could catch a taxi to their super secret hideout unless they then killed the pilot afterwards and erased all traces of his ship. So who brought them here and where's that ship now? 
Anyway, finally, they are getting ready to mobilize and move out and go and help Grief Karga. Now, it's worth bringing up how the timeline works here because, oh, it's bad. It's really, really bad. Right, okay, get this. The rebel pilot, from his side of things, he has to get the message, prep his ship, fly from the outer rim all the way into Coruscant, make it through Coruscant's never-ending sky traffic, land, travel to the headquarters, talk to his commanding officer, travel back to his ship, prep it again, make it back through traffic and out of the atmosphere, contact R4, find Mando's location, fly there, land, talk to the Mandalorians, then leave. Then the Mandos have to have their meeting, give their speeches, decide to help, prep for combat, make a plan, fly to Navarro, and then make their assault. Meanwhile, what's happening on Navarro? Pirates have opened fire on the city. People have fled on foot to a distance that's still within eyesight of the city and is certainly not safe enough to stop or take shelter. Then the pirates have come in and started harassing the remaining civilians in the city. That's it. That's like half an hour of time on Navarro versus hours and hours, if not days of time for the rebel pilot. It's like, just because the camera stops rolling in between important scenes does not mean that time stops passing. Now, obviously I was exaggerating a little bit, maybe. Perhaps the droid preps his ship for him in advance and maybe he can bypass traffic and land right at the military HQ. It's still going to take far too long. As usual, the writers just have no concept of time in any of these shows, it's unbelievable. Now again, the pirates are just behaving like little schoolyard bullies, just, you know, treating all the civilians terribly, which you'd expect from pirates, but, but it's like, have the courage to make them properly evil in what they're doing, or don't, but try not to make them just look like a bunch of out of control children. It doesn't exactly make them very intimidating. Like, they're just, being pests for the sake of it. There's no reason for anything of what they're doing. They're just like, we're the bad guys and we're here to do bad guy things, but we don't want to go too far and do too bad guy things. So we're just going to bully some people and sort of harass everyone and get drunk. Like what? Anyway, if it started getting good with Paz's speech, this is where it really starts getting cool. Mando comes in and attacks with the N1 and then he draws the fighters away and he basically engages them in like a 10, 10 to one dogfight and it's really cool. Well, he provides the diversion, Bo-Katan brings in the Comrade class and deploys jetpack Mandos into the city streets. And this is one of the coolest parts of the show so far by a long shot. I mean, just to see this in live action, oh, it's so cool. I love that. I've always loved these ships for that very reason. Dropping the jetpack troops out the bottom is just, it's such a cool visual. And so seeing that happen is awesome. One thing that's kind of strange though is she says she's dropping team one, which implies there's at least a second team still waiting to be dropped. In fact, we saw them on the other side of the ship. And I was hoping she would go and drop them on the pirate ship. But nah, she just drops them somewhere else off camera and it's never addressed again, which is sort of an unfulfilled promise. Not that she was, not that it was a promise that she would drop them on the ship, but it was like setting it up as if there's going to be something cool is going to happen with the second team and then nothing does. Also, if she did drop them on the big ship, then they could have commandeered it for themselves, which would have been a much better decision than ultimately destroying it like they did. But no, that was a miss missed opportunity as well. Still, seeing Mandos in combat is awesome. And for the most part, they're not completely useless this time, unlike when they were fighting the turtle crocodile. Basically, this part of the episode, we get to see a really cool ground battle and a really cool air battle, and it's all really fun to watch. And, you know, this is what we want more of in a show about Mandalorians. Like, why make us wait through three seasons to get only one or two scenes like this each year? Like, you know, season one, we had that cool scene with the Mandos coming in to help um, the Mandalorian escape Grief Karga. And season two, we had some pretty cool scenes with Mando fighting alongside Bo-Katan and her people. And then now we got this, but like, why make us sit through so many side quests and irrelevant plot points and just boring, slow nonsense? This is what we want. A show about Mandalorians? We want to see Mandalorians doing awesome stuff. And so finally we're getting it and we should have gotten it right from the start, but here we are and it's awesome and I can't complain right now because it is really, really fun to watch. Yeah, look at that. There, Mando's still got the R4 unit. So he just was like, you're a traitor? Uh, all good, man. Just come with me anyway. I mean, 
Why not at this point? I, I don't understand. But the N1 Starfighter is really cool. It's, it's really cool to just see how fast and agile it is compared to the other fighters. And I mean, he just cuts them, cuts them to pieces so fast. It's, it's really cool. And then while they're, while they're distracted, Bo-Katan makes an attack run on the main ship. So the captain recalls his fighters, the last couple of them who are chasing the Mando through a canyon. And they just pull off and go back to the ship. And it's like they just completely forget that Mando exists. And so I'm watching here and I'm thinking like, no, just because you stop trying to shoot him doesn't mean he stopped being a threat. What the heck are you doing? And sure enough, he punishes them for their mistake, which is good. I'm glad he did. But like, how could they not see it coming? They act surprised like, oh, Mando's still here? Obviously Mando is still here. You didn't kill him. What were you thinking? Meanwhile on the ground, the Mandos get surrounded and pinned down, and it seems as if they forget that they have jetpacks and also armor, but maybe there are valid reasons for it, so I'll let it slide. And then Paz comes in like a boss and saves the day. But the fight isn't over yet because the pirates set up this big cannon, probably an E-Web or something similar, and it's actually big enough to do some damage to the Mandalorians since they sort of have to scatter and they get pinned down again. And for some reason, none of the Mandalorians remember do they have rockets? In fact, all they seem to use throughout this entire battle is blasters and grapples. But luckily for them, the armorer appears out of nowhere and uses her forge tools to take out all the pirates in that tower and neutralize the E-Web. And I say appears out of nowhere because she doesn't have a jetpack and neither ship has landed anywhere to drop her off. So I honestly, don't know how she got here, but she's here and you know, her fight with the forge tools and that, it's cool enough. For some reason, she doesn't bother to take the gun and you know, shoot the other pirates in the courtyard, but I guess she doesn't really need to because finally, the Mandalorians remember they have wrist rockets and then they quickly drive out all the rest of the pirates and basically pursue them out of the city. And once they get to the outskirts, they are met by Grief Karga and all his civilians on the edge of town proving that they too were only about a few minutes run from town, which further reinforces my point about the total inconsistency in the timeline of this episode. Still, the action and visuals of this whole fight scene were cool enough that I definitely still enjoyed it. Look at this absolute legend. We don't even get to see how he gets up there, I don't think. He's just up there and just like, just one random scene, some random Mandalorian just being an absolute boss. Pretty cool. Now the pirate captain realizes that he is losing and he decides to strafe the civilians as a last desperate act of vindictiveness. And honestly, this action only proves what we already knew, which is that he could very obviously see all the civilians from the sky. So I don't know why he didn't send somebody to go and, you know, go and get them or why he didn't just blow them up earlier or send some fires out to kill them. like. He could have done anything and he just let them stand out there until he'd like lost everything and thought, ah, why not? Might as well go and try and shoot them now. And then obviously Mando and Bo-Katan just like blow up his ship and he crashes and that's the end of that Hammerhead Corvette or whatever the heck it is. Which again, cool visuals. I liked it. I thought they were going to have a head-on collision there. Um, and down it goes. Again, a waste. You could have hijacked the ship and used it for your little uh, Mandalorian Empire kind of thing that you're trying to build, Bo-Katan. But... You know, whatever, I guess, better than letting the civilians die, you destroy the ship. Cool. Now all the civilians and Mandalorians are here, and Grief Karga gifts the Mandos a bunch of land and offers for them to live here as heroes. Which is great, because he actually means it. But even if he didn't, what else could he do? His people are clearly useless at defending themselves, and now they have an elite army of mercenaries on their land. They kind of have to give them something to keep them happy, unless they want a repeat of the pirate attack, honestly. But it's cool, I mean... You know, he did offer the land to Mando before, and obviously he actually does mean it. But you can sort of see an alternative situation where he might actually just feel pressured to do the exact same thing because he's scared of them. So then the armorer summons Bo-Katan, and get this, she makes her remove her helmet. Like, I'm sorry, what? Like, Bo-Katan clearly thinks it's a trap, but then, like, it's, it's so much more weird than that, because... It's actually just the armorer deciding to completely abandon the creed, but only for Bo-Katan, and she encourages Bo-Katan to abandon it. And she basically says, you can walk amongst both worlds, and so you can unite Mandalorians of both sects. 
But like, the only reason she can walk amongst both worlds is because you, the armorer, arbitrarily decided that the cult rules don't apply to her. Mando could do the same if you let him, but no, you forced him to do something you believe to be completely impossible, go and bathe in the living waters of Mandalore, just to redeem himself after he removed his helmet. Now you're about to just bend the rules, change the rules and say, oh nah, because it's convenient for us and convenient for me now. You can, you can, you can, the rules don't apply to you, Bo-Katan. They do to all of us, but not to you. You can walk among both worlds. No, you're not walking among the world. You're openly ignoring the cultist rules and not following their way. That's not walking in their world. That's just walking in the other man. Mandalorian's world but because this cultist leader just goes oh no nah, it's okay this one time or it's okay for this one person it's now just fine like what uh, like if she has the authority to do this she would have had the authority to just go all right Mando look I understand the circumstances of why you took off your helmet you know it's it's not ideal you shouldn't do it but but you know you're forgiven or whatever if she has the, like, the authority to do it here, why not there? And so I know it sounds like I'm complaining a lot for someone who actually wanted Bo-Katan to abandon the cultist ways and didn't want her to always keep her helmet on. But it's not about that. It's about how it came to that. You know, I wanted Bo-Katan to do it, but I wanted her to make the choice. I didn't want it to be twisted into some bizarre sense of obedience towards the armorer. That still undermines Bo-Katan's character and not just hers, but the armorer's too, because now she's inconsistent on a whole militant religion perspective of the cult, but only, only when it suits her. It's just made her such a worse character than she was. Like Bo-Katan should have made this decision on her own and it would have made her a lot stronger and it would have made a lot more sense if she did. And this is probably the weirdest part is that all of the Mandalorians from the cult just all accept it. They're just like, oh yeah, yeah, she can walk both paths, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. No, it doesn't make sense. You just, your leader just abandoned your ways. How is it not like Paz or someone just stepped up and gone, no, if you're going to think this is okay, we're not going to follow you. And again, I know I'm making the argument. Now I can't believe they've got me making the argument for the cultist ways because I think they're stupid and I think they should all abandon it. But just from a consistency of character perspective, I think it's completely out of character that all these Mandalorians would just go along. I mean, do you follow the cult or do you follow the, the armorer? Which one is it? Do you follow the way or do you follow one arbitrary person's interpretation of it? It's just these Mandalorians are not only like brainwashed, but they're also inconsistent now. Ugh. And in the last scene of the episode, we have our rebel pilot fellow. He finds the Imperial shuttle that was transporting Moff Gideon for trial. And it's been, you know, it's been hijacked, it's been busted into. And once he sends a probe in there to investigate, he learns that all the uh, rebel or Republic officers are all, um, you know, dead. And there's no sign of Moff Gideon. So obviously he's been broken out and he's escaped. And, you know, who would have thought? What a surprise. Of course we knew Moff Gideon had escaped. But, you know, I guess now it's on the Rebel Alliance or the New Republic's radar, so that's good. And here's the, the ridiculous part, is that he, he, as he investigates, he discovers a piece of Beskar embedded in the hull of the ship. And from that, he draws the idiotic conclusion that Mandalorians did this instead of the obvious conclusion that whoever did this is trying to frame the Mandos and set them up against the New Republic. I mean, I guess it is possible that there's another sect of Mandos out there who did break Moff Gideon out, but it just seems so much less likely. The most obvious solution, the most obvious uh, reason is, you know, someone setting you up. I mean, how would a fragment of Beskar even get embedded in the hull of the ship? I mean, what weapon do you have that can, like, shatter Beskar with that velocity that it would embed in the hull of the sh that's like how like what what do you even have that can break Beskar and leave a fragment who could have done that the, the New Republic officers or whatever they were like soldiers certainly couldn't have had a weapon powerful enough to do that on board their ship so even that I mean it's one of those things where the writers are most likely going to have us like have our, have the characters all go oh it must be mandalorians and just not think it through but if you thought it through for two seconds you'd be like that was clearly planted obviously um so we'll see how that goes in next episode all in all this episode was like the last one in that it was really fun there's a lot of like cool action and some cool visuals but it was mixed in with a lot of thoughtless plot planning and just below average writing yeah at least it drove the plot forward again even if it was only really bo-katan's plot 
and that's something that I sort of just thought is that Mando's looking closer and closer to like he's going to get the Boba Fett treatment where he becomes a side character in his own show. Like he's still around in this one. He's still doing things, but he's really taking a backseat compared to Bo-Katan. And that's not a complaint necessarily. It's just an observation. I actually probably like Bo-Katan better. I think she's a more interesting character. She's a cooler character. She's been depicted as being much stronger, so which just makes her already much more likable to, to watch her do, thing, do things because she's competent. Um, and so I'm keen to see where this goes. But for people who are actually fans of the Mandalorian himself, this might be a very disappointing season. Only time will tell, I suppose. So those are my thoughts on this episode. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Like the video if you want to, subscribe at your own risk. And until next time, keep your pen on the paper and your sword in the scabbard.